Hebrews chapter 11. If you found that, why don't you stand? We'll read together God's Word. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. We need to back up one verse because the chapters and verses were put into the Bible later. Originally, they weren't there. They are there for our convenience, and it is helpful when you're trying to find something, but it's not so helpful when you're trying to understand. You need context. And so let's back up a little bit in chapter 10, verse 39. Come forward through chapter 11, verses 1, 2, and 3. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's begin verse 39. <clears throat> but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Join me as we pray. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Spirit and the authority of your word that you would help us today. For the brothers and sisters in Christ that have come in feel discouraged and deflated by your Spirit. Would you bring encouragement and healing? For men and women that are here today that are not sure where they are, Christian or not, we ask by your Spirit that you might overwhelm in such a way that they might see the goodness of grace found in Jesus. And so help us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Hebrews chapter 11. You have set your eyes on the most well-known chapter in the whole book of Hebrews. And it's going to take us at least six Sundays you really could do more, go through and pick up all of the characters in Hebrews chapter 11. But it's going to take us at least six Sundays to get through it as the preacher here gives example after example of faithful men and women in the Bible that had their faith in God tested. When you read chapter 11, we'll go through it, you'll see... Faith tested in the extreme, which is relevant for us as we live in a society that seems determined to suffocate or smother our faith. When it feels like every single day is a test of your faith in God. Your faith in the God of the Bible. Some of us in this room have people that we love that have seemingly walked away from the faith. And in faith, we just keep begging God to do something. Even that is a test of our faith. And what we must never do we must never take our eyes off the object of our faith. That's what the writer is most concerned about. It's the object of our faith, not the fact of faith. I mean, every one of us in here today, we all have faith to one degree or another. You set an alarm and you had faith that that alarm would wake you up this morning. Now, on Sunday mornings, I set three alarms because I don't have faith. I had faith this morning, I put my key in the ignition. When I turned the ignition, the uh, electricity would hit the spark plug and that engine would fire up in a great symphony of V8 American sound. <laughs> I had faith that that would happen. And it did. All of us here have faith in something. We're not talking about faith as something out there. We're talking about faith in objective. He's pushing not your strength of faith, but the object of your faith. For us, it's explained in the gospel that God is a holy God who created everyone in His image. Every one of you, the image of God, but that image of God in you is disfigured because of sin, separated from God. 
God is also loving. He gives us Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. The gospel tells us that Jesus lived perfectly, died on the cross. God raised him from the dead. And that event is there so that any person that repents and believes, repents and trusts, it's not the power of your trusting, it's the power of the object you're trusting in. Do you? Do you trust? Do you trust God? And if so, how does that trust in the living God influence and dictate how you approach the issues that are waiting on you tomorrow morning? Maybe it's frustration at work. Maybe it's loneliness, loneliness because you're single or tension in a marriage. Faith. <clears throat> Faith alone doesn't do anything. Faith in the right object will infuse your heart with the real, with real gospel joy and walk you through every bit of that that's waiting on you tomorrow. Simple faith in the saving power of Jesus and His cross. It is the soft bed that we can sleep in and everybody here could use a little rest. Now today, to get the full punch of chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, we've got to back up just a bit and start with that last verse in chapter 10, chapter 10, verse 39. And we need to come forward, and I want you to see the joy, the joy in having faith in this good and living God. We're going to see that, we're going to see that what your tired faith does when the crucified, resurrected Jesus... What does your tired faith do with the crucified, resurrected Jesus? And if you believe, you can join the pantheon of believers, Christians that have lived hard lives and done so by faith. Because faith, you see, faith in Christ is the ground of our joy. Faith in Christ is the ground. Of our joy. Well, faith isn't static, is it? It doesn't stay still. It, is it, it, it isn't just there. It lives and breathes and acts. So then the question becomes, what is, what is faith doing right now? What is happening in your life right this moment? If you have faith in Jesus, what does it do? Let's talk about what faith does. Let's go to the text. Here's the first one, number one. Faith feeds my soul. Faith feeds my soul. Now, I'm making it personal. I'm saying my because what the preacher does when he writes is he uses the inclusive pronoun back in verse 39. He says, we, us. This is not just encouragement for somebody out there. This is for me. This is for us together. We, we are facing the same hard world. We're doing so with the same great God. But let's get the encouragement. Let's read verse 39 together. And I want you to be encouraged not so much by what I say, because I might come off script and say something not any good. You can be encouraged by what does the Bible say? Drink this in, verse 39. But we are not. Join me there, verse 39. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. Pause. There is not a thing. There is not a thing that Satan and all the demons in hell can throw at you to destroy you. When you are a son or a daughter in God, when you have been adopted by the blood of Jesus and you put your faith in the crucified, resurrected Jesus, you now are family. You are part of the family of God. You are protected. Paul knew that. Go and read First and Second Corinthians. He wrote those letters to a really, really rebellious church. And in Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, you know this passage, don't you? We are, Paul says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Do you... Do you know Psalm 23? Most Sunday mornings when I come up here, you're, you're in Sunday school still, or in community groups, I should say, and I come up to sound check. <clears throat> so I'm told to stand up here, 
and talk a little bit so they get the levels right on the microphone. So I'll stand up here and normally we'll quote the 23rd Psalm just because it's so beautiful and I know it, I can do it just off the cuff. Do you know the 23rd? You should take this week and learn Psalm 23. Well, we love it because it's good at a funeral. You sit on a bookmark. It's a wonderful picture of God as our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, David says. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still water. He restores my soul. He leads me on paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Here's your favorite part. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. Psalm 23, verse 5. You forget this verse. Psalm 23, verse 5. You have prepared a table before me in the presence of enemies. I'm being attacked and slandered. There's a maelstrom of violence and pain and depression swirling all around me. And you have set me down to a feast. When we take the Lord's Supper, we'll do that this month. When we take the Lord's Supper, what we're doing is we are reminding ourselves that our souls feast on Christ. That our nourishment, our joy, our ability to live a life of celebration, it's because of Him. Because of the cross and because of grace. So go back with me, verse 39. <clears throat> we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. That's not who we are. Now I get the back end, back end of the verse. We are of those who have faith and preserve our souls. Our souls are kept and nourished and strengthened because of faith in the grace of God found in Jesus. Now, you're sitting here this morning and you feel like your you feel like your faith has been beaten up and tested and stretched and torn? Come to Christ and let your soul feast there. What did Jesus say? If any man is thirsty, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, from his inmost being will flow rivers of living water. Faith in Christ, it feeds my soul. Look, faith feeds, spit out that other junk. Place your faith in Christ. Come to Christ and be joyfully fed. What does faith do? Faith feeds my soul. I'm going to give you something else to look at. Let's get to the passage proper in verse 1. Faith, faith makes me stable. I'm, I'm giving this in the first person because... This has been good for me. Faith makes me stable. When I can't tell right from wrong and I live in a society that can't do that, it makes me stable. I live in a recession and gas prices and every other prices have gone. Com I think people are just taking advantage, just charging more. Everywhere, everything's just much more expensive when the recession has hit and children raised in Christian homes are walking away from Christ and have a generation that's, that's struggling with gender identity and our top medical professionals can't tell me what a woman is. Honestly, I say all those things, it makes it feel like I live in a society that is not stable. Then I come here to this verse, verse 1. I want you to love that verse. The writer says, by faith. See, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Pause. Just look at it and drink it. Faith is. If we were reading that in Greek, uh, the word is, esten in Greek, would be on the front end of the sentence. It would be the very first word. It would be there for emphasis, and it would start off saying, is. It exists. It lives. It's real. It's a present reality, not just a, just a virtue to say, oh, she's a woman of faith. There's something more. James says it, it, it gets to work. That, that faith is, is a way of life. That faith in Christ, it is, 
It is Christ, the crucified, resurrected, reigning Lord Jesus. Keep looking at the verse, verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Things out there, down the road, I'm hoping for something good. Why can I hope? Faith is the assurance. See that word? You circle it. Substance, your Bible might say. Substance. That word literally means to stand under. What does faith do? Faith stands under. Faith is the ground. It's the foundation. It's the essence of things hoped for. I can, um, I can look forward to the, I can look at the future with a sense of hope and even positivity, even if I'm going through something terrible, because my feet are planted on faith. You see, faith is the assurance. It is the substance. You can look forward. You can go to God because my trust is in Christ who provides for the future. Do you know you can go to your heavenly Father, even with tears in your eyes, you can go to God, tears in your eyes, and you can go there in the name of Jesus, even in the midst of something that is so painful, so hard to think about, and you can pray for a better day, and you can do so with hope because it's faith. Look, this is not us uh, speaking something, this is not some strange heretical prosperity gospel. This is not speaking something into existence. This is not manifesting. This is not karma. This is not you repeating the prayer of Jabez 40 times and hoping it's going to work. This, this, is a, this, is, this is trust that Christ has saved you. God has you where you are. The test you're in is strengthening your faith as you look forward, hopefully. This is a stabilizing trust in the one who loved me and died for me. This is Jesus saying, you build your house on the rock, not the sinking sand. This is Job saying, the Lord gives and the Lord he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Even if he slays me, I'll still praise him. This is true Christianity. This is where we're headed. This is where we got to be. This is the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. This is what it means in your life for you to actually have Jesus as Lord. To trust the crucified, resurrected Jesus. To build your life on the stable rock that is Christ. You see what faith does? It, faith feeds my soul and faith makes me stable. It stabilizes my life. Let's go to the rest of the verse. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 1 again. Here's number 3. What does faith do? Number 3, faith moves me forward. Keeps you going. So the first half of verse 1 is kind of the, the foundation. We've got the foundation, but we don't just stay there. The second half of verse 1 moves us Forward. It's a first step forward. Let me read it to you, verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Assurance, substance, foundation. The conviction, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is convinced. What, what faith is? Convinced in the truth of God's word and the power of God's promises. That the truth of God's word is real. The power of God's promise is real. Look, this is more than just being settled on the foundation that is Christ. I am so thankful to have so many people growing doctrinally to getting a hold on the robust truths of the gospel and loving good theology and laying that foundation and making it firm. That is a wonderful thing to do. But we can't just stay there. That doctrine must give way to devotion. It, it, it's got to take us somewhere. That this conviction, all the convictions you might have in Christ, they've got to go somewhere. This conviction moves us forward. It's, it's one thing to know. <clears throat> it's one thing to have your place in Christ settled. You should. You should do that. You certainly need to do that. But this phrase takes us, it's conviction, you see. Faith is the conviction of things not yet seen. This is trust. What do we trust? We trust that the Bible teaches us that God is 
good and loving and kind. We trust that Christianity is bound up in the gospel that says that Jesus saves sinners. It's displayed in obedience to this good God. It, it means that you and I are compelled into kindness. A few years ago, there was um, a movement among evangelical Christians to, to have random acts of kindness. Random acts of kindness. So you sit in the drive through and uh, somebody behind you pays for your meal or somebody in front. I never get that part. I always just get the, an order messed up. I never get somebody paying for the meal. But they used to do some sort of random acts of kindness. And it sounds good, but the truth of the matter is, as Christians, we don't do random acts of kindness. We do intentional. Like there's reason behind it. The doctrine that we hold on to and the, the faith we have in Christ, what it means to actually live out the lordship of Jesus, means that the acts of kindness are intentional. Yesterday they had to close the closet. Lots of our people showed up to serve a community, not as a random, it was an intentional, planned out act of kindness to display the gospel, to give us ground to stand on, to share it. Conviction, you see. How am I to live <clears throat> each moment? How do I interpret the world and my place in the world? All right, let me just turn it. What are you, another way, what are you doing here? What are you doing here in this world? Why do you exist? This is where we need a catechism. Uh, the Pre Presbyterians have a catechism, Westminster Confession of Faith, and larger and shorter catechism. We normally just take their stuff and baptize it and make it ours. That's kind of how we get things. But the catechism has, uh, the first question is this, what is the chief end of man? What is the purpose of man? What is the purpose of mankind? And you have two answers. The primary purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. I started thinking, what if those two phrases, <clears throat> for the next seven days, from this Sunday to next Sunday, what if those two phrases became the driving points of your life? I want to glorify God and I, and I want to enjoy Him. I want to, I want to glorify God and I want to enjoy Him. What needs to change then? What needs to change in, in your life and behavior and outlook and attitude and actions and words? What part of your life this very day right now does not glorify God? What part? If you're married, what part of your married life? What part? What have you neglected? If, if you're single, what part of living as a single Christian man or woman there's a part that's not glorifying to God. What about your mouth, the words of your mouth, or the tone in which you say it? Or your attitude? Or, or some, of you are, some of you have been contemplating sin for some time. You are, you, you are thinking about adultery. Or if we, if we search a browser, or just plain spiritual laziness, what, what if right this second, <clears throat> what if right this second you asked God, God, will you please get rid of everything that does not honor you? What, what if I were to stop and pray right now for Hickory Grove, for our congregation, Lord, would you please remove everything from the people of Hickory Grove that does not honor you? And what if he, ans what if he answered it immediately? What would happen? Faith is a conviction of things I don't see. How does your life, I am convinced, look, my life, I'll just say it from a first person. My life exists to glorify God. If you're convinced of that, are you willing to take the drastic action? What did Jesus say? Jesus said, if your right eye is causing you to sin, tear it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, throw it away. Faith, you see. Faith, faith is going to give you the courage. That's what it takes. The courage to make the changes 
and then accept the results that are necessary for my life to actually become something that is glorifying to God. So that my life might be a display of the grace of God found in my Redeemer, Jesus. Faith. What does faith do? Faith feeds, makes it so I can, it feeds my soul. Not of those that shrink back, but of those who have our souls preserved. What does faith do? Verse 1, faith, faith gives me this, this great stability. When you have, when you have the, the gospel you stand on, it's the substance. Faith gives you conviction, moves you forward. I'll give you a, a fourth one. Let's go to verse 2, and there you find such a beautiful verse. Verse 2, we find out that faith actually pleases God. Isn't it good to know that there are some ways to please God? Faith pleases God. Do you see that in verse 2? By faith, and you'll see the phrase by faith a lot. But verse 2, by faith or by it, the people of old, that is the presbyteros, the elders, he's going to list them all in chapter 11, the people of old received their commendation. Commendation. Now slow down a bit and let's think now. <clears throat> Let's think, what does it mean, okay, by faith, to trust? So as Christians, we are trusting in the substitutionary death of Jesus on the cross in our place and the righteousness of Christ placed on us so that we are acceptable to God because of that. That's what we trust. And we trust that that is what saved us. But when you read verse 2, you find out that the Old Testament saints are saved like you and I were saved. The Old Testament saints, Christ had not yet come, but they looked forward through a glass dimly, and there they knew there was one coming that would be the Redeemer. You and I stand here on this side of the cross and look back to the cross, and we believe that Jesus dying on the cross for us saves us. It is faith. Don't think that in the Old Testament you're saved by works. The New Testament, saved by faith. It is God's grace through faith that's always saved His people. This text says that faith wins God's approval. That is the commendation. You see that word commendation? Two English words. Commendation or condemnation. They're very close in spelling, even the way they sound. Commendation and condemnation. And every one of us in here is one or the other, condemned or commended by God. The great Puritan uh, John Owen looked at this verse. He, he's got all these volumes on Hebrews. It's hard to read and plow through. But there are a couple of times you run upon something really good. And if you want to test your faith, if you want to know if your faith is pleasing to God, there are a couple of questions you might ask. Here's the first one. Uh, have you trusted Christ alone? For salvation. Have you trusted that the work of Jesus, His perfect life, Him dying on the cross in your place, God raising Him from the dead, that is your only hope in salvation? That any goodness is found in Jesus and Him alone. Have you trusted Christ alone for salvation? Here's another one. Um, do you run to the cross of Christ when you're in a terrible life situation? So when things are terrible, does it drive you away from God or, or does that terrible event drive you to the cross of Jesus? Here's one that hit me uh, pretty hard. <clears throat> do you rejoice more? Do you rejoice more in Christ than you worry about the state of the world? Some of us need to turn Fox News off. Let's turn it off. You, you need to be rejoicing in Christ more than you're worrying about the state of the world. Here's another question. Do you, do you rest, for you A-type, you achievers, you want to do, do you rest in the righteousness of Christ for your good enough? Or are you working thinking that if, you're just, if you'll just be really, really good, that that somehow is going to earn the affection of God and You've missed the whole import of grace. Do you rest in the righteousness of Christ? Are you resolute? Here's one question. 
Are you resolute about the future? Are you resolute about the future because Jesus is Lord? Can you get up tomorrow morning and start your day? School will be starting soon. My teacher's going back. Can you get up in the morning and be joyful to start the day because Jesus is Lord? Here's one that's going to affect us all. Are you willing to be hated? Are you willing to be hated by the world in order to be approved by God? Verse 2 tells us, by it, by faith, the people of old received their commendation. I'll just give you one last, one last thing that faith does. One last thing that faith is. Number five, <clears throat> faith is my moral compass. Moral compass. Every, every one of us in here has a worldview of some kind or another. If you're a Christian, we, we do hope and our intent is to have a Christian worldview rooted in the Bible. So watch what the, watch what the preacher does. Now he takes us all the way back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3 right there in verse 3. Let me read it. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God so that what is seen, the creation, what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Takes us back to the Latin as creation out of nothing, creatio ex nihilio, out of nothing, that God created everything we see out of nothing, that God spoke it, that, that our faith is rooted in God speaking the universe into existence. That it's rooted, our Christian worldview is rooted in the creation ordinances. This takes us back now. This is not. Sometimes we can be accused of you're trying to impose your values on the rest of the world. And the truth of the matter is, this predates anything. The preacher says, this is not just Christian. These are things that are good for humanity. He takes us back to creation. And the creation of the world, the creation of mankind, male and female, so that our morality is not subjective, but it is objective. It is, it is rooted in a truth that comes from God. Now, there's a lot you could do here with God speaking things into existence. You, you could do something with Jesus calling out, His voice calling out to Lazarus. But for our purposes, the Christian life is rooted in the crucified, resurrected Jesus. That Christian life has a morality that goes all the way back to Genesis 1 and 2. Our, our faith is founded in those creation ordinances. It's good for all people. I mean, this is why Christians, at least we should, this is why we treat all people with respect because of, of human dignity. Men and women created in the image of God. All people created in the image of God. That, that informs how we treat people. This is why, why do Christians think abortion is not a political issue, but for us it is a, it is a faith issue. It's rooted here in our understanding of, of life. It is God who gives life. This is why we take the stands to joyfully understand human sexuality like we do. The maleness and femaleness, that it is God who gave that to us and it is good. You keep pressing on Genesis 1. This is why we understand our dependence on God. Genesis 1 and 2 in the garden. Look, working hard isn't an old-fashioned value unless you take it all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2. This is why we understand that work is good. This is why Genesis 3, we reject, hate, evil. This is why we believe in the active sovereignty of God, that He's not just created and stepped back, that He is involved. This is, you go to Genesis 2, the creation of man and woman, Adam and Eve, and there they are. In Genesis 3, the two of them falling into sin in the garden. And then being reminded of Genesis 3, 15, our, our need for a Savior and the plan of God to send one, you see. You, you ball all of that up and you find out that faith in Christ is the ground of our joy. And this preacher would say, today, if you, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. 
come and receive the grace of God found in Jesus. Will you join me as we pray together? Let's end our time praying together. I want to talk to those of you that are believers in Christ. you got someone you'd like to pray for today. You need to pray for. God has strengthened your soul and reminded you of good things today and you can walk out of here joyful. You have people you need to pray for. Others of you here, there are men and women here, young men and women possibly, that, that you've not been sure of your salvation and today you've heard that Christ will save you. Today when we sing, I'd just like to invite you just to come forward. Walk right down here to the front. Our pastors are here. I want to pray with you and start the conversation of you having Christ and Christ being the joy and the foundation of your joy. Father, thank you for your word that is good. Thank you for grace that saves. We pray that, that you would find us faithful. Help us tomorrow to live to glorify you and enjoy you. And God, even now this morning, we pray that you would, by your spirit, call people to yourself. Father, we pray that you would strengthen us. We pray that you would make it so that we are men and women that live our individual lives and collectively as Hickory Grove in such a way that Christ is honored, that we live by faith and receive the commendation of God. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand, please, as we sing together?